When the civil rights movement became the black nationalist movement, the misogyny that uh, black men share very deeply with white became more and more intense. Black nationalist men took this and started researching African history and began to say, well, in Africa, it is always the men who rule and the women bear children and they plant their little vegetable gardens. You must retreat from the controlling role you have had and, for example, symbolically walk three paces behind your man. During political meetings, we will sit and busy ourselves with embroidery or some such things. We will not talk when the men talk. The energy that should have gone towards fighting the system turned itself on to fighting black women. And the failure to deal with us as human beings, the insistence that to gain our manhood as black men, we will spit upon black women. Because that will give us the strength we need to fight white men, you see. Uh, that is where all of the energy went. And that is one very important reason that the black movement has in large part fallen apart. I was worn out. I was exhausted. I had seemed to have lost energy and interest in something called the black movement. In politics, that means. And I began to read feminist theory. And I said, oh, it is possible for me to use every part of myself and still be political. I don't have to say, well, that part of me is, is female, and that's not important. We don't have to talk about that. This part as the exclusively black part is fine, or this part as the leftist part you know, and not the black part is fine if I'm at a white leftist meeting. All of a sudden, it was possible for me not to have to deny huge portions of myself to be politically active. And when I say me, you know, I, I speak for, I suspect, most black women who encountered feminism. There are horror stories of women who had been uh, brainwashed into believing we were supposed to answer every black man who approached us on the street because, of course, it was all about sisterhood and brotherhood and love. And some man would say, hey, sister, how you doing? And you would say, hello, brother, and you get slapped. In some occasions, you might get raped. The next thing you knew, this man was following you down the street saying, oh, you know, let's go to bed. And you'd say no, and he'd be screaming, you dirty black bitch at you. You know, what's the matter with you? Every trick, you know, every exploitative warrior trick men have ever used was rolled out on us in the name of the black movement. My encounters with men, you know the simplest encounter with a man, whether a man you work with or someone you uh, have dinner with, the simplest encounter can turn into a conflict. So one is always watchful there. I'm always assessing women I meet um, in terms of, you know, how do we feel about them? How are we relating to such and such situation? For better or worse, there is not a situation in one's daily night life that does not have feminist subtext, um, superstructure implications, and one is constantly aware of them. Even when you want to rest, it stands up and hits you in the face. All right, there is a very good sentence written by a black woman named Kay Lindsay in which she said, where the white woman is the sexual object, black women are sexual laborers. Yes. Uh, white womanhood has been the prevailing standard of feminine, femininity in this country. If you were beautiful, you had pale skin. And women have only gained by being beautiful. You had light skin, preferably light hair. You were gentle, you were retiring, you were sweet, you were chaste. Because of our historical position as black women, most of us were slaves, which means we worked as hard as any men on plantations. Then we moved into factories. Most of us were not pure because on plantations we were um, bought to be breeders and whores. We were not qualified for the pre prevailing standards of, of femininity, white femininity, so we were cast out. If you are a woman who does not fit women's standards, you're a piece of crap. So we were totally, we got none of the benefits of being a woman. They're double-edged benefits, but they are benefits. Money from wealthy men, so on and so forth. We got all of the liabilities. As, as I said before, we are on the lowest rung, even in a profession like prostitution, because we are valueless as black women. So we were brought up outside the pale of femininity, but we weren't considered worth turning into useful men. You know, because what is a black woman? She's a woman and she is also black. We weren't as good as black men, and we were useless. We weren't good enough to, to be imitated white women, so we had nothing. We were total outsiders.
which is why, you know, economically, we are on the absolute bottom and psychologically, if you will, of the barrel. As I say, figuring out a theory that will embrace the paradox of fighting sexism, fighting the sexism of a group of people who are fighting racial and economic oppression from another group. It's a very interesting pyramid. It is black women being oppressed by white women who are also black women being oppressed by white women, black men, and white men. That is a situation that only non-white, if you will, black, Latin, so forth, Chinese women find themselves in. It is the kind of complexity that the white feminist movement has not yet in any way attempted to deal with. I believe the role of a black woman is to work for a just society, in the kind of a society in which children can grow up without fear, in which they can hope. Don't you think so? Really, you know, to boil it all down, a uh, black woman is a mother of civilization. Mm -hmm. That adds it up. <laughs> she is. She's um, actually the mother of, you know, that's it. She's the mother of the earth. She brings, she bears forth fruit to fertilize the soil. I agree. <laughs> we have, I agree. I think that's, we have overlooked the fact that black women uh, have for, been for the white nation. We have, uh, we have sucked, they have sucked us dry. That we have nursed the children, we have fed them, we have done everything, uh, put all our energies, all our work into working for the white family. And now it's time for us to take all our strength all the strength that Monaghan says we have, you know, we're supposed to be the strongest woman anyway. It's time for her to take all our strength, all our milk, all of that, and put it into working for the black nation. I'd like to touch on something here. I'm glad you brought this up. And I don't know what reaction this is going to get because a lot of people jump at me when I say it. But um, unfortunately, all people in this country, black people and white people, are subjugated to the same system of media, are subjugated to the same systems of communication, are subjugated to the same conditioning. And that's something we definitely have to reckon with if we're going to ever get through any of this stuff. Moynihan, that's sort of the name uh, that's associated with that word matriarchy, definitely has to be dealt with. Um, I'd like to deal with him right, face to face. Right, right. I think that, that unfortunately a lot of us, black men and black women, believe in the myth of that matriarchy. And I think mm -hmm. that, that, that that belief engenders a lot of negative things. Number one, it, it says that matriarchy is inferior to patriarchy, which is a whole thing right there. You see that patriarchy is a sort of natural or divine order of things, which is not so. Two, that black men have believed and internalized the myth of white womanhood in this country and Anglo-Saxon impositions so that they place us in relation to where white women are. Um, There's two things a woman, I believe, being a black woman and a very proud black woman can do for a man, make him or break him. And then you take into consideration how the black man has been berated by the white man. His woman, you know, adequately couldn't have the luxuries of another woman born the same just like her. This man has to, you know, black men have stood by for a very, very long time and been humiliated by, the, you know, the system. He can't get the job that this fellow can get. And you must understand that his wife might have to go on welfare. He has to stay in the humility of that. He has to watch the plumber duck if the welfare worker come in there. Mm -hmm. You understand me? He has always been like, made to feel he's below the next man. So you must, all this you must come, you know, take into consideration. You know, now black men are learning, you know, that they're part. They're beginning to feel like a man. They're getting their dignity and their pride back. So he needs a woman to keep on pushing it. Vice versa, you know, when you say about, you know, in the system, this system has destroyed actually the black man. You know, because uh, everything that we've ever done, there's no part of this country that you can say, if you touch that, that a black man didn't bring it in here. You know, everything that they built, they've never been able to share with it. I don't even want to hear that, you know, what society have done 
just took our black men and destroyed their manhood. That's what they've done. They ain't the better. Mm -hmm. I, I, please, I'm, I'm yeah. certainly not in disagreement. I'm in 200% agreement with everything you said. I think we all are. But might not, excuse me, might not be, you know, like, we understand that, that uh, um, what the brothers are going through now, as you say, the cultural national, but might not it all be very revolutionary, and you might be the better woman for understanding that they, at this point they need you to walk a few feet behind and get their manhood together. Uh, so if it takes that, then I'm going to do whatever the brothers need now. I mean, I've been doing a lot of research on slavery and talk about wiping out and ripping off our people. They did it to the black man. They did it. And if it takes, at, you know, at this point, it, you know, a cultural nationalist say, you got to walk four paces <coughs> behind me, baby, slow. If that, that might be revolutionary, I'm, I'll do that. I mean, I'm going to do anything at this point that's Bertame, needed. is that revolutionary? How I, revolutionary is it if one half of us is in condescension and a kind of We're almost fear saying, saying, walking 10 paces behind you, I'm saying that in order for me to, quote, regain my manhood, Maybe that's I have to deny you your right peoplehood. No. Uh, is that revolutionary? I think we I'm really saying, have to explore that. If somebody that. really needs that, you know, I, I don't, what, what we, just, we just have to do whatever we need to do to See, help these black See, that says to me that you together. really believe that there has been this thing called a matriarchy that, as Moynihan I put believe it, we've been ripped off as a people. Black people <laughs> have been ripped off. No, we haven't been yes, ripped yes, off. Yes, but you're no. not oh. saying that the internal thing <laughs> that, no. that really... I'll take that back. Uh, black people haven't been ripped. Black people have been ripped of every, every <laughs> ounce of hum, hum, yes. human things that's entitled and do another human being. Right. Do you know you how know, we really can't is. get this together? Yeah. And, and really, <laughs> because to me, this is very alien and we shouldn't be sitting here talking about uh, defining something which has been defined for us. We should be about redefinition. Mm -hmm. And I don't particularly care whether I walk alongside, in back of, or in front of. That is going to have to be defined for me by my man. Uh, we know too well what our, what, what our being is all about mm -hmm. in the United States of Europe. Uh, we we have to deal with that that's why i started out by saying are we talking about changes within existing systems because that's all we're talking about we're talking about a black nation within within a european nation and if we have to deal with that then let's let's redefine our own culture and stop being a subculture stop worrying about the man that's yeah. deifying him who is the man you know i, I agree with you except sorry go ahead <laughs> no i just wanted to um mention in terms of, of cultural nationalism and what, you know, brothers feel. Um, I don't know, you know, if it's all true that brothers would like you to walk ten paces in back of them. But I do know that um, we do have a definite role. And until we play our definite role, they cannot play their definite role. Mm -hmm. And our That's roles right. are complementary. Complete and make perfect that which is imperfect. And that uh, if we go about being the inspiration of the nation and again educating the children of the nation and participating in the social development of the nation mm -hmm. that it would be no problem and when we say we should not discuss things we start out to discuss them like why raise Monaghan if he's invalid don't raise him don't talk about him I, I really believe this very strongly that as much as we would all like to say that and struggle every day re-examining ourselves to do just that that we are unfortunately very much a part of that dominant culture it does affect us now if it didn't affect us we wouldn't be fighting crackers and that's the truth of it if it didn't affect us we wouldn't get mad hmm. about what mr moynihan writes and if it didn't affect us certain people would not react to the myth of the matriarchy in the way they do and that's why it has to be exposed and destroyed it's not that I really want to spend time talking about Mr. Moynihan it's that I think that we have to get rid of the illusions we have to get rid of the poisons we have to get rid of the lies and one way to do that is expose it and dissect it another way if we create a new life a new value system and live it as exactly. an example that's what I'm talking exactly. about that's it. that would probably be the that's best it. way because then people could see it as a living thing and not as a theory because what we need to do is to uh, um, reestablish a new value system. That's what black people need. Right, value and how, system exactly. Anymore. And how do we go about that? We go about it the way you go about daily work. First of all, you decide what you want. You establish your value system, you start to live it. Mm -hmm. 
and the people in your community, you start talking to your neighbors. You get yourself together first. Exactly. Then you get your community together. See, we're in agreement. Then you get your we're neighbors agreement. together. We're in agreement. Right. Yeah. 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 And then you can move on out. <laughs> but in the beginning, you got to make sure you got yourself together. Right, right. right. You okay. Know, you have to start right here. <laughs> but I think we ought to be sure we understand what she's saying. Now, uh, this uh, relates to what you said earlier about the black nation, right? Exactly. Um, I'm not sure I understand what you mean by the black nation. I mean black people's lives, being self-determining, defining yourself, naming yourself and uh, having political power. We're a nation already without political power and military power. We're a cultural nation without political and mil military power. We're a nation, you know, in captivity by another a people, a people who have a different, totally different culture than we have, who cannot even relate to the things that we relate to. That is, that is the problem. And as black women, we have to be the inspiration for the nation, for our men. We have to start out into the community educating the children, educating ourselves. Because once we educate ourselves, the children will become educated because we, we are the ones that teach the children. We are the ones that decorate the homes. We are the ones that are with both female and male children. We are the ones that the children look to as the image in terms of their daily education. So it is important that we don't get our values mixed up and feel that we have to educate the world. We haven't first educated ourselves. Ooh, it's still right always on, a self right thing. For... Indeed. I mean, the world will relate to us once we can relate to ourselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, I think we are afraid of definitions and afraid to set guidelines because we might have to live by them. <laughs> <laughs> If you stand up and say a black woman should do uh, this and that, then you might have to do that. But if you say, well, it's, it don't have, we don't have to say anything, you know, we can just do it. Do what? So like everybody can do their own thing. But every society needs a value system. Every society has a criteria in which they live by. And, and we, we live by one. everybody else's body. Exactly. Oh, right. We should have exactly. a lady. I mean, you know, it's, it, 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 you know, you'll find that it's really interesting. Most of the pushback I get in the academy <clears throat> is about this concept of women as perpetrators of violence. And, you know, it's at this point, I mean, when you talk about white women, it's just so much work has already been done uh, to kind of show. I mean, it hasn't been theoretically done. It's kind of been historically archived, like Martha Hold's book, uh, some of the work uh, that, that's come out in the, in the sexual relationships about uh, white women and lynching, uh, like uh, Grace's book. You know, uh, there's a new book by Melissa Stein that talks about the sexualization of black men next to white women. You know, so the work's been done that people can find out, like, oh, yes, this actually happened. You know, there's there's accounts of white women cutting off the genitals of, of black men who are lit. So it would stand to reason that if you believe someone like Baldwin, that there's a homoeroticism uh, involved with, you know, white men's fetish of black male genitalia, that at the very least <laughs> there's some sort of sexual attraction or eroticism uh, with white women doing the same thing. So I don't, I don't know why uh, at an intellectual level people can't grasp that. At an ideological level, I think this is what happens when we've accepted certain tenets about white women that actually supports racism and white supremacy. Remember a little earlier I was saying that we bought into the idea that because we call white women minorities, that they're somehow equal to all the racialized groups in this country. That means that in that dynamic, we historically say things like, well, white men were the rapists, white men were the lynchers, white women are the uh, white men were the perpetrators of racism just because of a legal terminology that was introduced you know in the second executive order to include women in the title seven <clears throat> and affirmative action in the 70s that disregards history in other words i'm saying that many of the ideas that we think are theoretical are really are really ideological in the sense that they just justify an already established order of 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 anti-discrimination policies from the 1970s and if you really want to get if you want to get specific about it when you think about it this is the same arguments that we get out of intersectionality right we care about race class gender creed religion things of that sort because these are the things listed in title seven right so you know this is this is us using legal categories to read history instead of the other way around which would be to use history to inform how we interpret certain um, policy or legal categories or even theoretical concepts generally so in saying that I think that what we've overlooked 
um, because of white women's legal, and I'm putting that in quotes, legal minority status, is that they very much participate in the same things that white men participated in. In fact, if you go back to the 1850s and 60s, when you look at some of these first suffragists and first wave feminists, if you if you prefer that terminology, these white women were not interested in questioning patriarchy, despite what people say today. These white women were very insistent that the home was their safeguard, and that they did, they did not want to give up the kind of natural moral authority that comes with womanhood. Um, after you get black people being free, you know, this is Melissa Stein's work. It's an excellent book uh, called um, Measuring Manhood. Uh, she actually argues that the con- concept of gender was formulated around issues that white male scientists saw rising now that you had white women and free black men. So. In other words, the concept of gender did not emerge around white women's interests or around womanhood. It actually evolved around free black manhood because now that posed a threat to womanhood, and they had to theoretically and scientifically figure out what that threat was. If you take that reading of history, which is actually true, and you transfer it into something like what Louise Newman is talking about in The Origin of White Women's Rights, then you can see that the arguments and origins of feminism and white women's rights was not about them becoming equal uh, to black men, it wasn't about them becoming equal in society generally. It was about them taking the reins of white supremacy. So if you read things historically, like the actual development of what white women were arguing for, then you see that most of the notions we have about white women's rights or white women's positionality in the United States has always been to be a greater part and handmaid of white supremacy, never to act against it. And that means fundamentally that they were participating and supporting the notions of white patriarchy. And one of the things we find in the 1890s, you can see this by people like Charlotte Gilman, is that you see white women wanting to come out the house, but in coming outside of the home, which was the safe barrier from the white, the black male rapists, they wanted white men to make society safer from them, which meant eliminating the black male rapists. So this is why around the Reconstruction the turn of the century, you have this huge increase of sexual oppression, this huge increase of lynches. So, you know, fast forward that to what we're talking about in, you know, in uh, To Kill a Mockingbird in the paper, the issue just isn't the incidence of rape. The issue is <clears throat> how white women, because of their position as a colonial uh, or a colonizer, our slave owner, our master, or any of the terms that you want to use that codifies that same kind of language, and the native male, that in all these kinds of historical relations, they functioned as the patriarch. Because the same kind of rape the bl- the white man would do to black men and black women. See, nobody even wants to talk about that homoerotic link, right? That white men also rape black men during slavery. That's the same tools of domination that white women use the most the same populations. So if white women are in fact, imitating or creating a certain kind of logics based on their gender and its relationship to Native men and women, then we have to consider that. And I think, honestly, one of the reasons that we have such a hard time with understanding white supremacy is because we keep reading it as a phallic extension of white male domination and not as a phallic extension of white women's desire and aspiration to actually rule and dominate the world next to white men. So when we attack white men, notice there's a reproductive aspect of white culture that's never attacked, namely how is it that white men constantly get recreated and recodified with the same cultural aspirations and expectations. The last 40 years of cultural studies, the last 30 years of black studies, well, that may be unfair. Well, the 80s, yeah. So, you know, 20, 25 years of black studies has attacked white male patriarchy. It says nothing about the ways that white women interact and are culturally assimilated into white supremacy and what they, as the reproductive forces in white culture, teach children. So what I'm trying to do in my work is not just identify them as rapists. That's a big part of it, but also to show that the capacity that white women have historically is one of the unearthed aspects of white supremacy that we must pay attention to. The issue isn't to keep criticizing white men. White men have power. White men die out. We know that. They understood that since the Empire of the Mother in 1853, 1863. The real question is, how then does the race keep reproducing itself on the same basis? And that is a female principle. And that's what, And even if you look at the Academy, there are very few works that actually criticize white women and practically no works and this is the ironic part about it despite people claiming they work in race and gender there are practically no works that criticize white women for their role in racism and rape 
what's happened is we've displaced criticisms of women in under the gender category under feminism and that criticism largely revolves around inclusion or exclusion in other words it's been recodified into a post integration logic where it says oh well the problem with white women from the 1860 forward wasn't that they were raping or castrating black men or starting WKK kill organizations or owning slaves etc the issue was their movements didn't include black women's interests and that's just a paper thin explanation of what feminism was actually up to from 1860 to the 1940s much less the 1950s if you want to go that far right but depending on where you want to start second wave feminism from so all this really accumulates in the fact that we don't have a real substantial knowledge of white women's actual actions within these time periods and what we do is we say well since they're erased we assume that everything they did was good and liberatory and that's a naive re- reading of history all right. I mean, I was I was really impressed with Crystal Feimster's work, <clears throat> Southern Horrors, because what she says is that one of the reasons that you don't see white women in these pictures of lynching is because they took them out. Right. So there was a deliberate effort by the white race. And given that knowledge, it makes perfect sense because the womanhood is supposed to be the moral center of your race. You don't want to show it as barbaric. So you would take them out of the picture. But she's like, you know, people would still report them. There's other family photos that show them there, et cetera. So you've got to think about it. There is a deliberate effort by white supremacy to remove white women and make them the kind of, you know, center of moral virtue and, 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 and progressivism. So ask yourself, if this was such a patriarchal culture, why would they do that? Why would they be so invested in protecting the moral image of white women in a system that's supposed to be completely dominated by men? So that means that there's a separate interest, a racial interest in keeping that notion alive. And I think that that's something that we need to explore. The fact that they were president lynchings, the fact that they practiced castration, the fact that they were rapists, you know, all this accumulates into a very rich history of how white womanhood is, if not identical to patriarchy, similar enough to have a separate matriarchal lineage that is just as barbaric, just as tyrannical, and just as historically wrong as the argument of patriarchy. Remember, because that the argument that we're making at best starts at the, at the turn of the at the 1800s. It's not like people actually know what was going on in the 1780s, and they're saying that's American patriarchy. Our notion of American patriarchy at best, you know, starts in the mid 1850s. So if that's the case, then feminism rises. White feminism rises up with that exactly. Right, because that's when we see the birth of gender in America.